Hello. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Healthy Aging and Care Annual Public Lecture uh, in celebration of the International Day of the Older Person. Um, I am not Linda King. Um, unfortunately, Linda King, who is Pro Vice Chancellor of Research and Global Partnership at Oxford Brookes University, uh, was looking forward to doing this introduction, um, but at the last minute was pulled away to something um, else and sends her apologies for tonight. But So you got me. Um, who am I? I am Jason Danley. Uh, I am a reader in anthropology here at Oxford Brookes University, and I am also the chair of the Healthy Aging and Care Research uh, Network. Uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's lecture, delivered by the wonderful Penny Thulis, uh, entitled Advancing, Not Retiring, Reframing Aging and Retirement. Um, before I get to Penny, I'm going to have to say this bit about housekeeping. So uh, we're not expecting a fire drill. So in the event of a fire alarm, please leave the building by the nearest exit. That may be up there or down here. Uh, and uh, meet at the assembly point in the visitor car park on Gypsy Lane. If you have not already done so, please switch off or put your mobile device on silent. After the lecture, we will uh, welcome a panel up on stage to uh, continue uh, to respond to, uh, to Penny and to sort of continue on the ideas that she's brought up for us. Uh, and hopefully that will give you a little time to, to think about uh, questions or comments or responses of your own. Uh, and we would love to hear from all of you at that point a little bit later tonight. Um, we are also recording uh, this evening's lecture through our lecture capture system. When it comes to questions from the audience, we will be using and recording with a microphone. So someone will be coming around with that microphone. Um, let's see, we will also have uh, feedback forms. Um, so I think most of you uh, have one of these feedback forms. Uh, if you haven't, please, uh, find one uh, on your way uh, out. Uh, we would love to hear what you think uh, about this evening's event. Uh, we would also love to uh, be able to get in touch with you later about other events that are held uh, by the Healthy Aging and Care Network. I promise we don't send out a lot of emails, just a few. Um, we would also love to uh, send you a link to the recording of the event so you can come back and relive this wonderful talk. Um, so that's the uh, feedback form and please grab that on your way out. Okay, um, did I cover everything? Um, oh, I would also like to welcome uh, and thank uh, Claire Malandine here, uh, who is our British Sign Language interpreter for this event. <laughs> there. <laughs> and um, I would also like to just say that uh, this room ha is enabled with an induction loop. So if you do use a hearing device, uh, you can set that uh, to T uh, and um, be able to use that. Okay, thank you uh, for bearing with me. And now let me tell you a little bit more about our speaker. Um, probably for a lot of you, this is someone who needs no introduction. Uh, many of you already know Penny, but for those who do not, um, Penny Thulis is the former CEO of Age UK Oxfordshire, and originally training as a teacher, uh, Penny went on to work in the disability field in both the statutory and voluntary sectors in the UK before joining Age UK Oxfordshire in 2000. 
HUK Oxfordshire, as I'm sure many of you also know, uh, is a local independent charity working in the community to enable and empower people in later life to live their best lives. Becoming CEO in 2015, uh, Penny is passionate about overcoming inequalities, about co-design, changing the negative narrative on aging, and challenging damaging ageist attitudes and beliefs. As a member of the UK network of age-friendly communities steering group, Penny also supports uh, the development of age-friendly, uh, the age-friendly movement locally and nationally. Penny has also been a huge support to us at the Healthy Aging and Care uh, Network here at Oxford Brooks, um, both as a member of our steering group uh, and our public advisory group since 2019. Uh, her, her presence in both of those bodies has always been uh, inspiring and has kept us grounded in the real life experiences of older people here in Oxfordshire. So she has, has kept us accountable uh, to the people that, that matter most. And that is, is absolutely uh, vital for us um, and, and for all researchers, I think. Um, she has also uh, presented for us many times on different subjects uh, such as loneliness and isolation. But however dark uh, or that material might be, Penny has a way of keeping things very engaging, uh, and she she isn't afraid of of making some hard hitting points, for which we are also grateful. So during this lecture, Penny will explore the questions of where our attitudes to age come from, why they matter, who can change them, and how. But for now, uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Penny Foods. <laughs> okay, well, good evening, everybody. And, and Jason, thank you for that introduction. Um, no pressure to live up to any of that <laughs> at all. Um, so it's really, it's really good to be here. Uh, it's good to see so many faces. I feel as though I'm speaking to a room of experts and I'm on the nursery slopes um, and I'm using the term experts in lots of different ways there. But really uh, what, what, what I'm going to share is a few ideas which come out of a very personal place of personal experience um, and relate those in a sense to the political context in which we all of us find ourselves aging. But before I do any of that, I want to thank the um, Healthy Aging and Care Network. So this is going to sound a bit like a mutual admiration society, isn't it? Um, but I, I do think it's doing a special job and a really important job. It's, it, it's first of all, bringing researchers across Brooks together to share across different specialisms and disciplines, but it's also opening up the doors to the outside world. And that part, that's partly what, what's happening here tonight so that we have the best possible chance of putting the findings of the excellent research which is being done here at Brooks around healthy aging. We've got the best possible chance of putting that into practice if we're working together. So I think a big thank you. I know there's an awful lot of work involved in it and, and I'm really grateful to you for doing that. Also a massive thank you for always marking International Day of Older Persons. That feels sig symbolic and a really important thing to do. Um, Last thank you before I get really boring, I am going to say other things as well. Um, the last thank you is, is just for thanking you, you for, for inviting me 
to talk this evening. Um, it, it's um, it, it, it's a pleasure and a privilege to to, to be able to talk to to this group, um, and I'm very pleased to be doing it. I was not saying that uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was in Cornwall, thinking, "Why have I got it? Why have I said I'll do that? And why do I need to be reading all this stuff about ageism while I'm trying to switch off?" But I'm 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 in full positive mode this evening, so um, so all good. The the timing of the invitation was, from my perspective, interesting because I was at a point of planning to finish paid work so retiring but I'm, I'm that's the only I'm, that's the only time I'm going to use that word uh, because I'm 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 on a crusade against using the word retirement because I think it conveys an awful lot of ideas that we need to get rid of if we're going to successfully age or healthily age um but I thought when the invitation came that maybe um, it would be interesting this evening just to explore one or two of the personal experiences that I've been having over the last few months in terms of running up to stopping work. Um, and thinking together about the context within which we're doing that, the kind of social and political context. I think we have a room of people who are at different stages of growing older, but every one of us in this room is growing older. Um, that's a given. Um, so we will be bringing different experiences in, into the room with us, and I'm hoping that we will be able to have a good discussion at the end. I think my job is just to... To, to stimulate one or two ideas, really. Um, the, f the first thing I found when, when I had made what, what felt like quite a big decision to, to, to finish paid work um, was that there was a certain amount of pressure to do it well. As chief executive, now former chief executive of Age UK Oxfordshire, it felt as though I should have some kind of recipe or um, or, or, or way of ageing and making the most of later life. Um, and I, I, I don't actually uh, so so if, if if anybody is here because they thought they were going to get the recipe that's not that's not what i'm going to talk about this evening um i i've read a huge amount of research about later life um i i i know a lot of the theory around what helps us as individuals and as a society to age well. So I, I know that stuff. I have that stuff in my head. I know that we need to be physically active, that we need to focus on retaining our muscle mass and our strength and our balance in later life. I know that we need to eat healthily and perhaps go a little easier on the alcohol. I know that we need to maintain our cognitive abilities and work at that. Um, and I know that creativity is a really important aspect of aging well. Um, older people themselves talk about the value in, in terms of uh, uh, supporting their well-being uh, in relation to creativity. I know we need to stay socially engaged and I know that we need some kind of meaning and purpose in our lives if those lives are going to be as rich as they can be. So I, do, I know that stuff theoretically. What, what I don't know, what I haven't done the work on, what I haven't really put in the hours on is what that means for me what that what my aging well is going to be like because we all age differently and we all are very different what what do I want my later years to be about and how do I want 
to to live them. What does what does aging look like for me? Um, what what in of that list of things that I that I that I talked about in relation to aging well? Which of those things in, excites and inspires me enough? to give me some lift off, and I will explain the bird now, <laughs> just in case you're wondering. And this isn't the only slide, by the way, there are more to come, equally riveting. Um, so how, how do I get that lift off? You know, watching a big heavy bird like that take off, it's hard work. It, it, it takes some effort to lift off the ground. But here, this bird has found a thermal and is gliding beautifully. And so how do how do how do I get up there? How do I manage that glide? Um, that's those are the questions that are interesting me at, at the moment. Um, so I look back at the list again and I think mm, physical activity, that's probably never going to excite and inspire me, but I do know that I need to do it, so I will. Um, I get I start to get a bit more excited around the cognitive uh, and the creative. Uh, the pile of books beside my bed, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, is monumental and it's spilled over onto the bedroom floor and it's now taking up quite a good bit of the spare bedroom floor. Um, so I've got a mountain of learning, reading, absorbing a whole lot of stuff which fundamentally has been a bit on hold whilst I've done a chunky job um so that so that's 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 that excites me um the creative excites me because I think that might offer me some slightly different ways of exploring what aging means for me um so uh, maybe some writing uh, maybe some painting, different ways of learning about myself, really. Um, but I suppose the thing which gets me most excited is the is the idea of finding something which has meaning and purpose and which will keep me feeling that I have a an important role to play in the wider world. Um, so really, probably that might look like some volunteering, don't know, haven't worked it out, going to take a break to think about all this stuff. But just these are the things that are going around in, in my mind. So that picture is a great deal more self-assured and confident than I am feeling um, at the moment about the next um, about the next stages. So this is my aspiration. I'm, I'm traveling very positively and I'm aspiring to glide, um, but I'm not at the point where I've I, I found the thermals yet. So that's 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 the that's the very personal, and I hope you will forgive me for sharing that. Um, I found it quite an interesting thing, but I probably would because I'm me. Um, I, I'm I'm very conscious that I'm just a, a really a fledgling in terms of um, thinking about the next stages um, and learning to age and accepting age. Um, so all of those things, I'm, I'm starting out on, 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 a, on a journey. Uh, actually, I started, I suppose, when I was born, but um, I've reached a different stage of that journey now. Um, so why, why have I called this advancing and not retiring? You're thinking she's finally getting to the point. Um, well, I found that I had a bit of a problem with language around the next stage of life. I, 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 and and just just talking about it to people, um, because I was, I was very uncomfortable with the idea of retiring, and I'll, I'll I've got some examples of why in a little while. 
Um, and the early conversations I had with people were frankly quite a mess um, because they we sort of missed. I was using euphemisms and, you know, finishing work or moving on or, or using all of that language to try not to use the retirement word. And so people said, have you got another job? You know, so we got into some very confusing places uh, unhelpfully. Um, I had one conversation with somebody who said, I had no idea you were 70. I'm totally amazed you have managed to keep going in that role for that long. And I thought, oh, <laughs> OK. I wasn't really quite expecting that, but hey-ho. Um, so found myself looking for some different language. And what we tend to do when we look for different language is we go to the thesaurus. And we look for some synonyms of retirement. Uh, this was absolutely my favourite, put out to grass. That's not, even, that's not even me actively going out to grass. That's being put out to grass. I'm thinking, that's not really where I am at all. Um, there's a whole load of words around giving up work. I thought bowing out seemed a bit... <clears throat> Probably not quite where I was at the moment, but hey -o. Um Then there are a huge amount of negative words around withdrawing, retreating, throwing in the tap, just, just, just basically stuff about disengaging and giving up, um, even surrendering. And I'm thinking that's why I have problems with the word retirement, because those are the connotations that it has. And that is not where I, I feel myself to be. And I'm sure many people in this room would feel the same. And then there are the, and then there are the words around um, the, the sense of retirement, which is all about withdrawing into yourself. So secluding yourself and severing connections. So I was just, I was just interested in that language. Um, there were very few antonyms for the word retirement or retiring. Uh, and, and, and the one that appeared most often was advancement or advancing. And I thought, okay, yes, that's where I think I am. And I'm imagining that a lot of people in this room are probably feeling in the same place, that we are advancing through a different life stage, but nonetheless going forward, we're like that bird, we're, 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 we're definitely purposefully going forward. Um, so that's, that is the meaning of advancing and not retiring. Um, now, it, it, frankly, as a bit of language, it doesn't work ever so well, because if you say to people, I'm advancing on the 15th of September, <laughs> It, it, it doesn't quite hit the spot. Um, you have to expect, you, know, you have to. But I, 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 I'm, I'm being quite flippant. I do think that whilst ever we hold on to words like retirement and lock ourselves into the concept that comes with it, which is quite negative, um, in many ways, I, I, I think I think our opportunities for uh, aging well are, are much more limited. Um, and then I did what we do, which is I, I, I started to think a bit more broadly about why this language is as it is. And of course, it's part of a bigger picture, which is a bigger picture about the language we use around aging. Um, and our ageist views and our ageist culture. Um, and I, I, I found, I started to do, I started to do some reading, I found this quote from Ashton Applewhite, some of you will have read the wonderful Ashton Applewhite. Um, and she said, we live in a culture where we've yet to develop the language and the tools that we need 
to help us deal with the changes that aging brings. And I just thought that's interesting because it was chiming with, with very much with where, where, where I was. Um, and that led me on to some more thinking about ageism uh, and, and about discrimination. And I reached a point, I, I went back to that menu of things we need to do to age well again. And I thought, I think I need to do something about confronting ageism, confronting the ageism in myself, but also confronting ageism um, elsewhere, if I'm going to age as well as I might. So I thought that I would say just a few things about ageism. Many of you will have done way more reading than I've done. You will know a lot more than I do. But ageism is quite interesting. It is one of the protective characteristics, aging, age. Um, but it, it, it appears to still be um, a prejudice that is socially sanctioned. We, we think, we somehow think it's okay to talk about senior moments or to, to, to use certain language around aging, which is quite demeaning um, and belittling. So, it, and, and that, uh, I'll talk a bit more about this. I've, I've got some birthday cards to show you later because that it's a nice, quite, quite, quite a light example of how the, 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 the socially acceptable it, 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 it appears to be. To, to, to be ageist. So I've put, I'm not going to read out the World Health Organization definition of ageism. It's, it, it, it's up there for you all to see. I think it's quite a useful one. But there are several definitions, all very similar. It's fundamentally about bias against people on the basis of their age. Um, and I think there are some that there's some interesting work, which again many of you will be familiar with, around uh, different kinds of ageism, and and I will I'll just talk about them very briefly. Uh, one of them is institutional ageism, so that's where we have our ageism built in to uh, the, the 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 way we run things, um, in, embedded. Um, in the in the way we run things, um, there's interpersonal ageism. So that's the that's the kind of ageism that comes out in our interpersonal relations with with people. Um, and then there's self-directed ageism, which is the ageism we internalize. That's the ageism that stops us from doing some of the things we might do as we age because we think we're too old or because we think we can't do it or because we think we've passed it. So that 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 interests that that interests me quite a lot and I will say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, it what 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 is what is the harm in ageism? You know we all do it we all we all I, won't, I shouldn't say we all, I should own it as myself. We laugh off things that we do and we think they are attributed to age. We think, you know, the real joke, the birthday cards will show this much more clearly than I can. But there's the thing about being in a room and forgetting why you've come into the room. And we sort, we, 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 we buy in to the idea that that is because it, that's related to age. It's not related to age. We've done that all our lives <laughs> and we will continue to do it. So why do we buy in to that, to that view of ageism? Um, I, 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 just, I, I just think that's interesting. And then why does it matter? Well, it has quite a significant impact on our lives. Um, the way society sees older people and represents them affects the way they operate in everyday settings. Um, so we get uh, we, we get ageism in the workplace, which which lowers the expectation um, on older workers. There are, there's quite a lot of research around the fact that tr training is very often not made available to older workers because they thought, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's the thing, isn't it? 
Um, so so that the, the, there is a real impact on us as we age of that of, of those attitudes um, and, and that discriminatory practice. I think in healthcare, we will all be able to think of examples in healthcare, maybe one of the most uh, the, the one which makes me crossest is the access uh, for older people to talking therapies as opposed to medication. Um, now, talking therapies are proven to be more effective for people in later life, and yet the rate of take-up of talking therapies amongst the older population is very is 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 vanishingly small. So that's and that's a kind of self censorship that both we as older people, but also the system um, does. Um, so that matters. That has a that has an impact on people's lives. Um, it, lim it, it limits our own behaviour, it, it, it affects how we see ourselves and describe ourselves. I, I remember in one of my first weeks uh, with age concern, as it then was, going to a, a, a group of older people and talking really about how was it for them, how is it for you? And one of the things that has stayed in my head is the fact that they talked extensively about feeling they were on the rubbish heap. So one person said, I feel as though I have been put uh, or put out to grass. It's a bit gentler than a rubbish heap, isn't it? Um, but 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 that that sense that the things that matter I, I, I am no longer part of. So um so that that matters because we limit ourselves. Um, and we limit the value that we place on older people's lives and the enormous opportunity there is in later lives to really um, light up our society. Um, and, and we miss that if we, if we shut a door um, and, uh, and, and put people behind it. Um, I think the other way it matters, so I, I was interested, uh, I, I found one study which showed that um, for people who have a, a, a more positive um, outlook on later life, a positive self-perception, a perception of themselves as being of worth, uh, it, that, that appears to add something like seven and a half years to people's lives. So that 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 matters big time. And it's something, well, I'll get on the soapbox. You might already think I am on my soapbox, but you wait. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll talk about what we can do about it in a bit. So where do the attitudes come from? This is quick and this is this, this is quite quick. They depressingly they start really, really early. Uh, so they start around the age of three. Um, we start to um, we we start to show ageist um, attitudes, uh, and we're surrounded, aren't we, by a whole load of myths and fears and stereotypes. They're all around us. They're even in the road signs, and I like this so very much because it is an attempt to reframe uh, a road sign, which fundamentally confirms a huge amount of negative uh, negativity around aging. So that, 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 that's in part where it comes from. We, we, we are surrounded by it in, in, in the language that we use every day, in the images that we see in the media, advertising, Film. Nice bit of research has been done by Centre for Aging Better about the um, underrepresentation of older people in British movies uh, of, of the last 10 years. Um, but in TV ads, um, only 5% of um, ads feature anybody over the age of 70. 
most of those are quite negative. So I'm not expecting to be appearing in an ad anytime soon. Um, and only 20% features somebody over the age of 50. So that that's just, we're just sort of drinking this stuff in all the time. Um, and it And it is having an impact on us. It doesn't just reflect the society that we're in. It shapes it, and that's why it's so important, and that's why we need to be working to do to, to change it. Um, we have a view, don't we, about economic productivity and material wealth, and we have views about youth and the importance of youth and youth culture. So all of that feeds in to our ages attitudes. We see repeatedly very deficit models of aging, very negative pictures of aging, or we see the reverse. We see the totally heroic. We see the mountain climber. We, uh, you, how many of us are going to aspire to that? Um, so th that, 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 that I also find quite interesting. And then there's an interesting narrative, isn't there, in the media around um, intergenerational conflict that's sort of poking it. Um, and, and, and that feels exceptionally unhelpful um, as well. And then I sort of, I got to a point where I thought, do we, do we really think our future self is, is, is inferior to, to our younger self? Do we, do we really believe that as we age, we, 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 we become inferior to something we were when we were younger? And I, I, I don't buy into that. But I do buy into a lot of ageist stereotypes. So I'll, I'll fess up to some of those in a moment. So let's have a look at media and advertising. Um, what, what have we got here? We've got, um, we've got the battle against aging, which is being fought by Olay, apparently. Um, and um, we have anti-aging heroes who are all selling us something in a bottle or a tube. Uh, so we've got that multi-million pound industry selling us, staying young, uh, coming at us all the time. So there's that element. Um, I have no idea what that advert on the far left is about. Um, is this, I've just organised my create cremation, would you like more wine? Is it? I, I just don't get it, except it doesn't seem to bear any relation to the point at one's life when you might be thinking about organising cremation. So I just don't get that. Um, then we have that, that, then we have the two gentlemen uh, with loneliness is a terrible thing and no friends. Nobody, uh, uh, me least of all, is denying that loneliness is a terrible thing, um, but presenting it quite as often as we do, usually linked to fundraising. So it's it's it's, it's usually uh, it, it's usually part of a fundraising ask around loneliness. Um, that is very unhelpful to us in terms of thinking about what, what our later lives may be like. I'm not saying that loneliness may not be a part of those lives. I'm not saying we shouldn't be talking about loneliness and isolation. But I am saying if that's what we have coming at us all the time, um, then, then that's unhelpful. But finally, there is some hope because apparently according to The Guardian, so it's got to be right, um, makeup is out and grey hair is in the week it became cool for women to look their age. Now, I thought that that just, you know, that, that made me, that gave me huge hope for the future, I have to say. What I don't know is, what, this was a couple of weeks ago, so I don't know whether it still holds true this week, whether it was just 
a kind of special offer in that one particular week. But personally, I'm going to be channeling my inner Helen Mirren uh, because who wouldn't? Um, so that so that <coughs> that's just an an example of some of the things we have pumped at us quite a lot. I said I'd talk a little bit about birthday cards, um, partly because it, it, it it's quite fun. Um, but it has a it, it has a serious point. Um, and there is some and there are some campaigns specifically around birthday cards and there are some campaigns around more positive um, reflections of aging. We send these cards to our friends. <laughs> this seems weird to me. I do think it. I do think it's odd. I think they are very funny. I chose the funniest ones I, I, I could find, and they are funny. I have to I have to agree. So then I find myself, you know, looking at myself and thinking, am I just having a bit of a crisis of sense of humor? Uh, am I making too much of this? Is this is this is is, is am I am I just making a big deal of something that is that is basically fun and that some older people when asked would say that kind of humor helps me to manage some of the things which might come alongside aging but i don't is it possible to read some of some of the yeah it is i'm getting nods so i don't need, i don't need to i don't get to do my jokes um and then as so i look at the cards and i think I, I I laugh. I mean, some of them, uh, some of them, I just find hilarious. And then I think, is that my own ageism? Is that me demonstrating my own ageism? If I find those things funny, I mean, you can see I have dark nights of the soul and don't sleep much. Um, so, what? Where does that get us? That's that 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 that's a lot of stuff that we that I've talked about, which doesn't help us to age well, or against which we are butting up or battling. So my my next my, my next few slides, and then and then I will uh, I will shut up. Um, are, are really about a call to action. They're really about saying. That ageism is is for all of us. It's the, it, it is a very strange ism, because it is it is fundamentally a bias against our future selves. We are all, with luck, going to be older, and that means that if we buy into ageism, we're fundamentally buying into a prejudice against our future selves. So it's a it's a slightly strange. Um, it's a slightly strange um, thing, but very prevalent. So I, I, I'm arguing that every one of us in this room has a stake in reframing the way we think about and talk about ages and... Oh, no, that's gone backwards. That's wrong, isn't it? And... and I'll, I'll slip in the retirement words, just, just reframing those things. And I think, um, what, what, what can we do? So, so if, 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 we, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we even feel a bit angry about this or a bit concerned about it, or we want to do something, what, what can we do? And I think, it, I think we start with thinking we need to wake up to it. We need to, we need to raise awareness. Um, and some of that is about raising awareness of our own attitudes. And I'm probably not the only person in this room who remembers being part of the women's movement back in the day. <laughs> and the consciousness raising groups we used to go to. Um, so, and they were all about um, enabling us to see within ourselves that discriminatory thinking uh, uh, in that case towards women but I think a lot of the civil rights movements um, have a lot to teach us in relation 
to ageism. Um, so I, I think I think doing some work around uh, just recognizing ageism when wh wh where is it? What, what what does it look like? Is it in me? Is it it, it, it will be? <laughs> Um, and then sharing that with other people. And there are some resources around that. There are, um, the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a booklet which suggests how you might be able to set up and run a, a, a consciousness raising group if that's something that you are interested in. Um, I've mentioned Ashton Applewhite before. If you haven't read Ashton Applewhite, uh, this chair rocks. It, 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 and, and you're at all interested by anything that you've heard this evening, um, then I, I would heartily recommend it. Um, it, it. It's a very feisty and lively. I think I'm not supposed to use the word feisty about an older person. Um, <laughs> Um, and then there are a whole lot of other resources, and I've put them on that slide. Uh, so the World Health Organization has got some good resources, a Center for Aging Better. And there's a wonderful website called Old School, which has a whole load of, of resources related to ageism. So people can just do a little bit more of that work. Um, and then I, I, I thought, well, there's something about us being part of the change that we want to see so what can we what can we do personally I, I i have a few ideas about what we can do as part of our organizations in a bit but this is a this is a bit of a personal starter for 10. um so there's there's something about just not colluding with ageism just to sort of just sort of gently Raising awareness of it, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really, I think, serious challenge in interpersonal relationships is probably going to be counterproductive. But ourselves, we might stop blaming ourselves for being older uh, when we catch ourselves doing it. So talking about senior moments, all of that stuff. Um, there is no such thing as what is age appropriate. That that that, that we we have we have internalized some ideas about what is what is appropriate at different ages. That doesn't exist. Um, I suspect putting that picture on this slide has an ageist element to it. Um, but um, I, I thought that it was a good illustration of there's no such thing as age appropriate age inappropriate. Yeah, I wrote that wrong, didn't I? There's no, yes. Um, resist, um, re resist asking people whether they're still doing, oh, are you still driving? Are you still working? Are you still, just, just sort of resist that one if we, if we can. And you look great for your age. Is, 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 is probably it's those sort of things that we do just 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 very easily. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging us to think a little bit more about before we do them. Um, encourage other people to reflect when they when, 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 when others are using languages like that. Just a gentle why, you know, why did you say that? Why have you asked me that? Those things uh, enable people to reflect rather than lecture and hector. Uh, seek out more intergenerational opportunities. So more things which bring younger and older generations together are going to be helpful in relation to this. And then for those of you who have not put away the banners, um, there are opportunities to campaign around this uh, and, and really calling out ageism in the public and the political sphere when we see it. Do we complain about adverts that are really rampantly ageist? So thinking about how we can start to get to get those points across, um, and I, I've banged on really rather. You think I'm obsessed with birthday cards, um, but there is a there, there is a there is a website 
uh, which which is challenging ageist um, birthday cards. Um, so I've put that on the slide. And for those of you who are on social media, there's a campaign called No More Wrinkly Hands. So that's about uh, the fact that we see in the newspaper very lazy uh, illustrations when, when we're looking at an article about aging of a pair of suitably tasteful wrinkly hands. Um, so and there's a there's a campaign on 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 Twitter X, as I should now call it. Um, thanks, Mr. Mosk. Um, uh, just to call that to call that out. Come back again. Then I, 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 I think there's a whole lot of stuff we can do around communications. Um, really do some work around checking that the language and the images we use are age friendly and avoid phrases like the elderly um, and, and, and speak instead about older people. Um, those are things that older people themselves have identified as being um, helpful. And there are some resources on the Center for Aging Better website, which help us to think through those kinds of the, the kind of language. And they have a wonderful image bank um, of photographs of people just doing normal things. So not climbing mountains, though there's no reason why we shouldn't climb mountains, but just living everyday lives. Um, uh, some great photos which I would encourage people to look at and 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 use wherever possible. Um, try to resist using othering language. So wherever we can, because we're all aging, if we can use the terms we and us rather than them and they, then that's quite helpful. Oh, and then talking about demographic time bombs and great tsunamis. So the things which present aging as a crisis, somehow it's a crisis for society. Um, it, avoiding those kind of terms is, is quite helpful. And, and I think um, I have seen silver tsunami used in, in a way to sort of, that's better than gray, isn't it? Um, no, I don't think it is. Um, there's a whole lot that there, there is a there's a kind of successful aging movement, which is all about um, showing positive images of aging and suggesting that there are there are successful ways to do this. Um, if we can guard against that, it's helpful uh, because it sort of implies that it might be your fault if things are not if, if things are not as as good as they might be. I think in terms of inequalities, that's a that's a particularly um, important thing to avoid. Um, aim to be as positive as you can, uh, but, uh, but avoid that the kind of romanticized views of aging and. I've, we've talked about stoking intergenerational conflict before. I'm so nearly there now. Um, then I've thought about who we might, who might be in the audience tonight, and and so I've thought: Are there particular things that we can do within the sectors in which we work? So this is not what we can do personally as individuals in our own lives, but what we can do in our, in our roles. Um, uh, there, and and I'm, I've started with the age sector because I think sometimes um, the age sector can be part of the problem rather than the solution. Um, and the more that we can work a lot with people in later life rather than um, doing unto. Last year, um, we had Ray Sandbach uh, giving this lecture, and he talked about aging well ambassadors. So this is, this is older people themselves having an important role in, 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 in raising uh, the profile of aging well. Um, 
it, it, this links, I think, a little bit with with my previous point. Um, but just we can we compassionate ageism is a thing. Um, uh, tends to be around treating people as vulnerable, and so it, it 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 it's helpful to avoid that if we can. The more intergenerational stuff we can do, uh, I think, the better. And finally, this whole idea of age-friendly communities, which started with the World Health Organization, and age pride. So let's have some pride and some celebration about ageism. The a uh, couple of points for employers. We will have employers, I think, in the room tonight. Um, there's a lot of research around age-friendly employment practices, uh, offering training, offering flexible working opportunities, thinking in terms of how we support people to move on to the next stage and out of paid work. Um, so those th th those those kind of things it, it can be thought of by employers. Um, in in the education sphere, I think we need to start. We need to recognise that whole thing about ageism starting at the age of around three, and we need to think about how we tackle that a bit more effectively uh, within the education system. Uh, and part of that is about intergenerational opportunities. Um, I think, please, Brooks, we need more research into all aspects of ageing um, uh, because that fuels uh, the, 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 the work of a movement for change. Um, and then in terms of health and social care, I think there's an urgent piece of work to do around rethinking our model of social care, which is a very uh, a deficit model um, and, and thinking um, about slightly different ways of delivering social care. And we do need to support unpaid carers much better than we do at the moment, many of whom are in, 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 in their later life. And, and then I thought, what can we achieve together? So um, what, what, what are the opportunities for us to, 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 to work together on this stuff? Um, and I, I, I ended up thinking that just simply by in, in, in our own workplaces, disciplines, starting to have conversations about whether our practice our thinking is ageist and how we might change it so just quite simple conversations I think the healthy aging and care network is a great opportunity to have them to have those kind of discussions around how we can collectively um, think about reframing aging I think I have two more slides um this one is about age pride. I'm not going to read it out because I think you, the writing is very large. Um, but this is suggesting that um, we, we all have an interest in working together around taking pride in our age, whatever age that might be. And I'm back to Bird at the end <laughs> but this time it's a it's it's a group of migrating birds so it's no longer the it's no longer the personal it's not we've, we've moved away from that discussion about the personal uh to the idea that working together um we can achieve a lot more in relation to this there I, I think I've gone on for too long uh, and, and said too much, um, but I hope some of it has stimulated some thinking. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you so much, Nadia. And uh, now I would like to invite our panelists uh, up here. Do these <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, and we'll just have a brief moment where each of the panelists will say a couple of words uh, in response. Uh, and then we will go to your questions and uh, comments as well. Um, Okay. <laughs> Why didn't Jason have it? Because I'm well, saving now. Maybe I won't talk about it. Um, I, can I have this one? All right. Oh. Now I feel like I'm doing karaoke. Or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I promise I won't do that. I will spare you that. Um, that was absolutely wonderful, uh, Penny. And um, so much of what you said really resonates with uh, with, with me, with my beliefs, um, you know, and, and um, I, I don't know. It, it, it was a very positive overall uh, talk, I felt, right? I, I mean, I love being left with this, this image. Um, I, I, it did remind me that uh, the Healthy Aging and Care Network is hosting a little activity uh, for the Festival of Social Sciences, which uh, we're going to be in the Pitt Rivers Museum uh, on the 27th uh, of this month. So later on this month. And the theme or the, uh, yes, the theme is uh, a wonderful, welderly world. So that word, so I'm thinking about language. Right. Uh, and uh, that word that you mentioned, the elderly. Right. And how can we transform that and put well-being first? You know, how can we make it so that when we think of growing older, our thoughts go to all of those ways that we have a chance for exploring new kinds of well-being um, in our life? Why doesn't why isn't that where our thoughts first go? Right. Um, so exactly what you're saying about advancing, right? Advancing into all these kinds of opportunities for well-being. So that is the kind of thing that we're going to do. So we'll be there talking about that, using some things from the museum to help uh, illustrate that. Um, but right now, I'm going to introduce the, the panel really quickly, and then we'll each have uh, something to say before we take questions from the from the audience. Yeah, go ahead. Did you hear that? Do we have any lights that we can have for the panel? <laughs> Thank you. All right, now that's wonderful. Okay, of course we we all know Penny there at the end. We also have with us um, yeah, Margaret Simpson from the Oxford 50 plus. Um, and just a moment. Um, we also have Paul Jackson from the Oxford Brooks uh, Business School. Um, and we have uh, um, Ben Spencer, uh, who is the research fellow uh, in uh, built environment and healthy aging. Um, so uh, I will be quiet now and I will turn it over to our panel uh, for their brief responses. Ben, what shall we start with you? All right, we'll just work our way down. Uh, thank you, and yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Penny. You, you've covered a, a lot there. Um, and I, I guess from my perspective, in terms of the built environment, you mentioned age-friendly cities and the important work that's done there to look at the multiple ways that places can be improved to make them uh, more age-friendly across the generation. Um, at the event organised at the Town Hall last week by Oxford 50 Plus. It was good to see the um, Safer Pavements campaign launched 
um, very much oriented around the benefits that could be gained by a wide range of people from having something really simple like better pavements that made it easier to walk on without falling flat on your face, being able to push um, a child in a buggy or um, move, move around um, in a variety of different, different ways. Um, and that made me think about some of the, the research I've done in the past, um, some around uh, mobility generally in Oxford, and um, a guy who was using a mobility scooter that found that the pavements were in such poor condition that he ended up on the road because he felt that was the, the best way for him to travel. So he'd rather mix it with the traffic than be on the pavement. Other research I've done around cycling, cyclists were choosing not to go on the road and mix it with the traffic, but to go on the pavement. So there's something there about the way that the environment is designed and used to make it generally better for for people. Um, so, yeah, re really need to think about the way that places can be designed uh, in terms of cycling. In the Netherlands, people start cycling when they're young and they just keep on cycling because they can and they don't really think about it. In this country, a lot of people stop cycling basically once they pass their teens and that's it. Um, there are a few people who may be in the superhero character ca <laughs> category who carry on cycling. Things are improving, but they could get a, a lot um, better in that dimension. So yeah, wanted to talk about that, thinking about the kind of broader context of, of places um, to age for everybody. Perfect. Thank you, Ben. Um, Paul, would you like to go yeah, next? Thank you. Yeah. And um, I mean, th thanks, Penny. Really inspiring uh, speech. So I I'm from the business school. I'm also sort of representing the AI and data analysis yeah, network. Right. But um, and I, if I just sort of start with one or two comments beyond that, I do read beyond my discipline, and um, the, there's a book that I, I you indirectly mentioned. Uh, uh, Becca Levy's Breaking the Age Code, you know, that seven and a half years you mentioned. Uh, you know, one thing I, you know, I would suggest to, to deal with these prejudices is make everybody read Breaking the Age Code. I mean, she's an American academic, but, uh, you know, her research backs up this notion that those people that genuinely believe, uh, you know, have a health, a, a, a positive view of aging, and it's statistically proven do have sort of seven to seven and a half years of extra life. And that's just a mindset change. So th there's, there's something that, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, we need to think about there. But, um, you know, in terms of the, the prejudice, I, I could talk about technology supporting healthy aging. I don't think that's in the, the spirit of this evening. That's, that's for a, a, another day. But, you know, where does prejudice and bias um, meet technology? That's my... Right, is, is my microphone on? It is. It is. Maybe, maybe if I move it up my lapel a little bit. Is that okay? Great. Thank, thanks for that. So that's okay. Um, so in, in terms of bias and uh, prejudice, where does that you know, meet technology, which is my areas, I was saying. The, um, you know, one of the things is that you know, we do live in an increasingly digital world. Technologies are um, there to support sort of life enhancing developments. They support, um, yes, elder care and social care and, and medical advances and, and things like that. But, you know, Ben was talking about design, how sometimes we design um, certain groups out of society because we don't include them as part of the, the development process. And you know, I think there's plenty of evidence that older people are not well represented when we're developing um, digital-based services or new digital technologies. And um, and that's also the case, you know, in the workplace. If we design work for all sorts of people with all sorts of abilities and disabilities, we will design better jobs. We will design healthier work places so it will work for everybody it's in everybody's interest to include you know an array of actors when we're designing work when we're designing technologies 
when we're designing technology-based uh, services. So, um, and I think when it comes to technology, you know, ditching some of the um, patronizing notions that we have, silver surfers, I've never liked that term, you know, as though, isn't it cute that older people can use the same technology? Everybody has a right to use this technology. So, you know, we, we need to think about the, the terms that we use when we're referring to different user groups with, with, with different, you know, handsets or other types of technology. Thanks, Paul. Okay, Margaret, over to you. Right, good evening. I am here representing older people, and I don't think that leaves very much to the imagination in whichever way you want to read it. I don't think Penny realized, but the almost penultimate slide showed a lady with young children, and she is assisting with their reading. That lady was my first director of social services when I came here in 1980. She is still alive and she is still very much involved. And the reason I was appointed was for community services. And the community services were for all ages post-education. So we developed in VISTA services from the age of 16 until, sadly, somebody died. But it was a mixed group of people. And I still try to continue that theme in life. And I think if we can think that we are all part of a community, hence the safer pavements, that is part of age-friendly Oxford. That is for from birth through to older age, death. Penny, should we call ourselves older, elderly, aging? What term should we actually use to represent, because I am a few years older than you, um, who we are? How should we actually refer to ourselves to be felt to be part of the community? So that's a big question. But we're talking, you were just mentioning the digital world. Liza is sitting there. And last Wednesday, as has been mentioned, there was the Older Persons Day, which is a United Nations Day in the town hall. And quite a few of people here and on the stage were there on that day. As a result of Oxford Brooks Business School, the students who are part of the business school course offered to do a digital workshop. As a result of that, we now have 32 people signed up from last Wednesday who are of the, I'll have to use it, older age group. And you had 20 students on the day offering their services voluntarily to help older people. They, we've been doing that now for 18 months, haven't we? But not to this number. So it, is, it shows there is a willingness on both sides, I feel. Not only do older people want to learn how to improve their IT skills, but we've got younger people who are also having to rethink their language because if they say to me, oh, you need to use this platform, well, what might I think? You know, I usher at Oxford Playhouse. The platform is actually the stage. We're on a platform now. Now, that isn't very helpful if you're looking at a phone and you're going diddly diddly and what have you. <laughs> There are a number of things that you actually mentioned, Penny. I must admit, I thought that was a bird of prey. And I said to Ben, why have we got a bird of prey up there? I never thought of the thermals, but I did wonder what that was there for. Um, as I say, I came to Oxford to set up community services, for social services. And I had a very long and in-depth conversation with Ian Hudspeth when he then decided that he was going to terminate community services. 
And I really feel as a result of that, there are many older people who are now sitting at home, unable to mix because they perhaps cannot get out and definitely cycle in a lot of cases because of aging. But they also can't afford the cost now of daycare services. And I did say to him, I thought then that the quality of life for some people was going to deteriorate because families are going to have to decide, do we go and see grandma, granddad, or do I take my son down to the football field because I've worked all day and I've only got a short period of time at night. And I do really think we have to look at the community as a whole. And yes, it will cost money, but I think at the end of the day, that might be a cost well paid instead of having people with increased isolation, possibly dementia because they have not got very much to think about other than sitting there all day long on their own. And I'm quite certain for the people who are in front of me, you are working in all sorts of fields that have a knock-on effect if you're not part of a community. I really do think you talked about talking therapies. I think if you communicate and you're able to communicate, it certainly will help life. Thank you so much, Margaret. That's wonderful. Um, now, uh, we have a few more minutes left, uh, and I'd love to take some questions from the audience. Um, we have, I see a microphone over here. Can I bring this microphone around too? I mean, you are so much. Are you? Okay. I'm going to come around here. Hello, um, Penny will not be surprised uh, from, from what I'm about to say. I'm going to throw a cat among the pigeons. Um, I had a friend who um, um, worked at Nottingham University Hospital uh, with children who um, had had some kind of acquired brain injury. And she used to give lectures in which every now and again she would say, don't make assumptions, don't make assumptions. But there were two sides to those don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions about what they cannot do, but also um, um, don't make assumptions about what they are able to do. And I think... Um, to me, while we're fighting against the negative aspects of aging, you need to be careful not to be trying to push people who are older into things that they don't actually want to do. I've been talking about um, um, IT. I don't actually want to be available on my mobile phone 24-7, um, apart from the fact that I can't because the signal's better in, 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 in the garden. But um, I think we, Penny, you were talking about talking therapies. I think we need to talk to people about what they would like to do and what we as a society can do to enable them to do that. But again, not pushing them into saying, um, you should be doing this, and the other to get you you ought to, you ought to be having new skills you ought to be get, and so just as a as a side effect thanks um let me see there were some more hands so we'll take a couple of comments well first of all thank you penny for an excellent uh, talk um I work for, well, I, I represent uh, the U3A in this area. And, and as you know, we've got half a million members in the country and a lot in this area. But one of the things that we have a lot of is talks via Zoom or Microsoft Teams from international people about in similar organisations or our own organisation in those countries. And in Australia, for example, the government pay local authorities or the local authorities collect tax, I'm not sure which, 
so that anybody, I think it's over the age of 60, is invited to a two-week course on sharing and using IT, using Facebook, making videos and so on. You don't have to attend it, I don't think, but that is a free course for, if you like, older people. And it's used, of course, in their case for promoting medical uses of AI and information. So there's two sides to this. We're going to have to get uh, increasingly aware that this is the way society is going to move. So that's my first point. And the second point on the international side is if you listen to people from Japan, you will see that the cultural differences between Europe, UK and themselves is enormous. So my question really is, do you think that the changing cultural and demographic base of this country, i.e. due to immigration or whatever, will in fact change the way in which your organisations have to think and respond? Thank you. Does, does anyone want to respond uh, to, to either of those comments? I'll give it a go. Okay. Um, in terms of technology, if I sort of look at technology in the round and respond to the earlier comment, that um, when, it, when it comes to applying technology, whether it's at home, in the workplace, or wherever, um, you know, we always need to be conscious of what's the most appropriate solution and what's the most efficacious. You know, got to think about what's the most economical. In, in Japan, there's been a lot of investments, a lot of experiments in sort of robotic technology because of the falling birth rate. Um, I don't see that as being the way forward because when you look at some of those um, experiments, you know, the, the Robert robot it's the, you know it's two hundred thousand pounds each, and you know once you invest in complex technology, uh, it's probably going to start breaking down. The more complex, more expensive it is, the probably less reliable some of that te technology is. So um, you know the, the the sort of the big robot solution is probably not going to be the answer. But there's probably going to be a range of different technologies that can be used for different sort of problems and. Uh, you know situations. The key key is trying to diagnose the 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 individual. What does the individual need? You know what's the range of support an individual needs, and where does technology fit into that? And if there's a sort of a cheaper technology solution, you know by all means go for that rather than a very expensive AI based solution. So that's just a general set of principles. I think, but I think the other point you're you're making is about the workplace. And you know I go back to what I was saying before about ergonomics you know if we are creating jobs so that people can you know work as long as they want to because it's not back-breaking work it's well designed systems are usable they're accessible they're safe that is in everybody's interest so I think that that's what we ought to be doing anyway and that opens up you know work and different occupations and different technologies for everybody and I think that's the philosophy that should run through that Margaret? Yes, I was just going to say what you're actually mentioning is called communication. And you were referring solely to the IT communication. And I do sit on various panels representing older people. And there are many older people who cannot afford IT equipment. There are many older people who do not want to use it and that is perhaps because they're afraid and they're not going to be able to cope with it very well. And I do ask the city council, the county council, to have hard copy and people can then participate because if you cannot be reading what is going on or you cannot hear it because I happen to, with others in this room, organize the talking newspaper for people with a visual impairment. So if you can't hear, you can't see, a result in a, a lot of cases are you don't feel part of the community. And again, it is community and communication. And whilst we are still alive, and I do say to them, you've only got to wait another 10 or 15 years, and most of us that haven't got the IT will not be needing it because I don't think wherever we're going to after we've left this planet, they will actually have IT yet. So, you know, I think 
you need to still please provide it in various forms. Thank you. Okay, this is okay. We're it sounds like we're out of time, unfortunately. I'm very sorry uh, for those of you who still had questions or comments or ideas. Thank you to our panel and thank you especially uh, to Penny for such a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming.